This is one of my favorite Sundays here, is because it is backpack blessing today. So, I would like to invite all children or youth or individuals who are part of the school system, or if you've brought your backpack, or even if you haven't brought your backpack, if you're a little one, if you're a kid that is going to school, if you're a big kid, come on up and let's do a backpack blessing. I'm looking over there, the big kids over there, come on over. If you want to just come on up over here, we want to get the, the yeah, we want to get the school year started right. So come on up and join me. Yep, just pile in here, pile in here. If you're a compass teacher as well, yes. If you're a compass teacher, come on up. We've got a good team there. 
We've got the whole crew. <laughs> like I said, there's an energy. Can you feel it? <laughs> All right. <laughs> don't worry, in about 15 minutes, that'll stop, and you won't even hear it. All right. <laughs> okay, so if you brought your backpack, if you have it, hold it up high. Hold it up high. Everybody got their backpack? All right. And then the congregation, this is the special part. If you are part of the congregation, I want you to raise your hands like this, almost as if you are stretching out and reaching out a blessing over these individuals, okay? That's pretty cool, isn't it? Take a look at that. It's like they're giving you a big hug. All right, here we go. Good and gracious God, we ask that you bless these backpacks, these little ones, these individuals going to school, and the leaders that are leading them. Make them strong for the job of helping kids learn. May their straps never break, their padding never give out, their zippers never jam. May they never be forgotten in strange places. May the burdens in them be light. May the bodies that bear them be strong and growing and whole and blessed and ever blessed by your love. In the name of the great teacher at whose knee we are all students. Amen. Amen. Nice job, everybody. Thank you, congregation. And I've got something here for your backpacks. And even if you don't have a backpack, pick out something if you'd like. There's a prayer stone or there is something to remind you of Jesus. Absolutely. See, I can't even hear it anymore. That's, yeah. Nice job. Oh, that's a good one. There you go. You want one trip? I don't know. I think this one is the perfect one for you. You got it? You good? There you go. Okay. And one more thing. Before It's a Black Hawk County van. If any IZK 119. If that's any of you, we'll just keep our eyes down as you move to the parking lot. Let's go. <laughs> hey, one more thing though. Okay, so I'm, I'm extremely excited about the team that we have surrounding uh, here at Compass, this, or at, at Zion. What an incredible family. And you may have noticed that it looks just a little bit different here in the sanctuary. This is the most obvious look up here at the very front, okay? That there's a little bit darker paint at the bottom, and you'll see that's going to look a little bit different even at next worship next week. But look at the walls here, all along the walls. Perhaps that's a little less obvious, but it is all painted. This entire sanctuary here, all of the walls and the back wall has all been painted. If you ended up turning in your time and talent sheet and you checked paint, you got a phone call and asked to come and help, and we had nine individuals that showed up and over three days painted this entire sanctuary. We had all of those pews in the back. They were out of here. We thought maybe we would just leave the pews out so everybody would move forward, but I see that everybody filled in from the back. Good for you. But they painted the whole thing. And so if you were part of that, we just want to lift that up. There are, again, nine people all showed up over the course of three days and painted this entire thing so that it was, I mean, it just looks wonderful. It looks beautiful. What a team, what a family that we have surrounding ourselves. Can we lift up praise? Okay. All right. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, with all your faithful followers of every age, we praise you, the rock of our life. Be our strong foundation and form us into the body of your Son, that we may gladly minister to all the world through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
A reading from the book of Romans, the 12th chapter. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everything among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you, you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we, who are many, who are body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in apportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 16th chapter. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we invite your Holy Spirit among us this morning and bless our time together. Please bless these individuals. Please shield them from what is my opinion and only reveal what is your heavenly glory. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So if you were to go to the next slide here, I'm going to start right out with a bit of Hard theology. I believe that by my own understanding or strength, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But instead, the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, made me holy, and kept me in the true faith, just as he calls, gathers, enlightens, and makes holy the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one common true faith. This is most certainly true. Now, don't feel bad if this paragraph isn't immediately familiar to you. If this paragraph is familiar to you, then you might be remembering back to your confirmation classes, or you have been reading your small catechism, and good for you. And if you don't have a small catechism, I have a stack of them in the back to give you. They are a free gift here. This is the Uh, explanation of the third article of the Apostles' Creed by Martin Luther. This is Martin Luther's explanation of that. And it basically just outlines there why the gospel lesson today is such a miracle. You did hear the miracle in the gospel lesson today, right? 
Uh, Perhaps it isn't quite as obvious as the feeding of the 5,000 or the walking on the water or even the healing of the Canaanite woman's daughter. And if you're reading along with Matthew, uh, perhaps you would even be surprised that we would have skipped right over a couple of other miracles. We skipped right over the feeding of the 4,000 Gentiles or Jesus' speech on the miraculous signs of Jonah. But here we are with this gospel lesson with what is historically called Peter's Confession of Christ. And me standing up here claiming that it is a miracle. And not just any miracle, a miracle that directly affects each and every one of us to this day. Belief. Belief is a miracle. Like I've said throughout the month of August, there is a certain recipe that every miracle follows. We have to start out with a mess. Every miracle begins with a mess, a problem that we cannot ferret our way out of, an answer that is beyond our control. And the second ingredient is turning a me problem into a we problem. Bring it to Jesus. Give it up. Your own strength is not enough. Regardless of how hard you fight, this life will continue to come at you. And then the third third ingredient, surrender to God's possible. Belief is a miracle. Belief in something other than self, that is a miracle. Belief in Jesus is a miracle that produced only by the effectiveness of redemption, by the sheer unaided power of God. Something that we need to remember here is that the miracles themselves, the miracles were not what made Jesus the Son of God. Lots of people perform miracles in the Bible. Moses and Elijah from the Old Testament, for instance. At this point in the narrative of Matthew's gospel, the disciples themselves have been sent out to the people. They have driven out demons. They have healed the lame. They have cured the sick. This whole month, we have been talking about Jesus' quite public miracles that have taken place. Like You can't feed 15 to 20,000 people on two separate occasions and not get people's attention. Not to mention him walking on water and turning water into wine, and healing people wherever he goes. And yet the question remains, who do people say that I am? See, if the miracles themselves were proof that Jesus was the Son of God, there would be no need for that question, right? Kind of reminds me a bit of Superman here. Uh, Actually, it kind of reminds me of Clark Kent just a little bit. Clark is never there when Superman is there. He is always absent, and now that I'm looking at it, his face looks an awful lot like Clark Kent, right? Uh, Regardless of the glasses. Even as a kid, like when I was six or seven years old, I can remember thinking, this is quite possibly the, the worst secret identity you could have ever come up with, right? They didn't even try. I don't even know who thought of something like that. Actually, the the last day of my third grade is when I got my glasses. Last day, third grade. And for a moment, I remember thinking, oh no, I'm going to go back to school and they're not even going to recognize me because of my glasses. Uh, They did, by the way, immediately. They recognized me immediately because it's glasses, right? And so this conversation with Jesus and his disciples is a bit like this. It's a bit strange and kind of ridiculous, if you think about it, if the miracles point to deity. If he was just simply trying to put on a a mask. But they don't. The miracles are not, the, the, the miracles themselves do not prove that he is God. The miracles themselves do not prove that he is the son of God. They are a tool used for something greater, for the bigger miracle. They are the result of the recipe that we've been talking about, a mess, a we problem, and surrendering. They are all the compass pointing to this miracle, the one that we heard today, the one that affects each and every one of you, the one that will forever affect you, belief. 
Belief is a miracle. If the miracles proved deity, if the miracles produced belief, then this seemingly harmless conversation with his disciples would have been just a nice little story. Maybe it's even a transition story between some of the more important things that we read last chapter and then the transfiguration, which happens next. What's the big deal with this story? Was it truly a miracle what happened here? Yes, is the answer. That's the short answer. And here's why it's so important. There are very few other places in all of Scripture that will provide so much meaning by understanding the location that it took place. This place was Caesarea Philippi. This is the little red arrow there is pointing to Caesarea Philippi. It was an incredibly impressive Greco-Roman city near a, a huge spring of water that comes out out of a cave. Uh, it was one of the main sources of the River Jordan where Jesus was baptized. It's located about 30 minutes north of Capernaum. That's just about like from here to Decorah. It's in the foothills of Mount Hermon. That's Mount Hermon where the transfiguration happens. And also, here's another thing. I'm going to put a different picture up there. If I was to put a golden calf picture up here, perhaps you would immediately think of the Exodus story where Moses went up onto the mountain, got the Ten Commandments, and came down to see everybody worshiping a golden calf. But that's not this golden calf. There's actually a couple more golden calves that were made in the Bible. This one, however, was placed at the very spot that Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. It was placed there by the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel on what is called the high place. And he ordered people to worship it. This is the second golden calf in the Bible, and he ordered people to worship it. In biblical terms, the fancy church word for something like this is called a mistake. The modern term for that is whoops, all right? The first golden calf didn't quite take, and God ordered everybody killed who was part of that particular debacle, and it didn't end well for the first kingdom or the first king of the northern kingdom either. This place has been associated with intense false god worship ever since. Evil for many years. The false god Baal was worshipped here. Later, the Greeks and the Romans, they used this place to worship the fertility god Pan. Pan was this half-human, half-goat-looking creature. Children would literally be thrown alive into the mouth of this cave as a sacrifice to the god Pan, believing it would appease the gods so that they could have a fertile crop. They would also do unspeakable things to goats in the courtyard, which is why artwork would later depict God, or excuse me, as Satan with goat horns. That image should potentially make you feel uncomfortable. That was its point. This is, they were not being particularly clever here by choosing the goat as imagery for Satan. It was just a sick cesspool of evil that represented the worst that Satan and humanity had to offer here at Caesarea Philippi. Later, it was literally considered the gate of the underworld, or the gate of Hades, as in Matthew's gospel it was called. That is what that mouth of the cave uh, was called. That is literally what it was called. The disciples were extremely uncomfortable coming to this eerie, demonic, dark place. No good Jew would be comfortable in this place. They would never even consider coming here. And however, Jesus purposefully brought his disciples here, sat them down at that cave, surrounded by all of that, and asked them, what do you believe? The world is represented here. The world and all its sin and idol worship, this place for so long has been used as a blatant opposition to God. Let's start there, actually. What does the world say that I am? A prophet? Elijah? Some say uh, you're John the Baptist back from the dead. You, you could be Jeremiah because some of us believe that Jeremiah was immortal. But basically, though, the disciples say basically the world says that you're just a guy. Interesting, Jesus says. Interesting. Because that's what you're going to get from this world. 
That's the level of understanding that you're going to be able to glean from your experiences and your successes and your failures. In your search for purpose, in your search for meaning, and this insatiable desire to have, to be something, to be something to someone, anyone, to be wanted, to be loved, this world will throw idol after idol at you, and if you're not careful, you will worship them. Look at all of them all lined up in a row. Pick an idol. They're on discount here. Every one of us is in danger of it, but sitting here in your sin, surrounded by everything that's wrong with this world, Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? Look past the flashy, the shining, the amazing bits of miracles here. The catchy and amazing and unbelievable things that you have seen and you have been allowed to do in my name. Jesus says, look past all of that and keep your eyes on me. What do you see? You are the Christ. The son of the living God, Simon Peter answers. And Jesus' response is almost explosive. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in who is in heaven. I cannot believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him, but instead the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, made me holy, kept me true in the faith, just as he calls, gathers, enlightens, and makes holy, the whole Christian church on earth, and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one common true faith. This is most certainly true. Peter couldn't do it on his own. They had a mess. They made it a we problem, and they brought it to Jesus. They submitted to God's possible, and they believed. It is a miracle that we have a God who loves us so much that we could be dead to our sins. We could literally be sitting at the gates of Hades here, literally be surrounded by sin and the evil and the hurt and the temptations and the awful of this world and have a God that relentlessly pursues us there. Surrounded by darkness, we are given God's light. But maybe you're not convinced by that. Maybe, maybe this one, this particular miracle is a struggle. Maybe it's hard to consider it as a miracle. Consider this, though. Your faith, your statement of faith, your declaration of faith, being here today, it might seem like such a small thing, right? But it's big. It is a big deal. Belief. Your faith. It makes a dramatic difference in your choices. Imagine just standing at the crossroads of your decisions. It's going to be hard here, but look, just think back at all of the decisions that you have made in your life. Some went well, some went didn't. Some didn't go well. Some went extremely poorly. Some of the decisions that you made were solely based on your own strength, and some you gave up to God. I thank God every single day for all of the unanswered prayers of my youth. Every single day, I thank God for those unanswered prayers of my youth because if I had just relied on my faith and my strength and believing in myself and the world that I thought that I wanted to create, imagine where I would be right now. Imagine where you would be right now. Thank the Lord above that God has a plan for me. And thank God my belief keeps moving my feet forward. How about you? Don't lose sight of this miracle in your own lives because it is so easy to minimize the sheer impossibility of belief, especially if we are surrounded by other believers, as if everybody has it. Belief looks completely different when you're surrounded by people who don't have it. Be the light there. Shine Jesus' light. Belief influences our choices and our decisions and where our life is going to go. It is part of our legacy, what we leave to our children. 
Because like it or not, we are one generation away from not having it. Think about that. That is why belief is such a miracle, because we are sitting here today. Here we are, 2,000 years after Jesus walked the earth, and we can feel him in our presence and in our lives as if he is standing right here with us. We cannot possibly hope to do this on our own, but by the strength of God. Belief is a miracle, because there is so much about it that is impossible. And yet it is the most honest thing that we have. And it is the rock on which Jesus built his church. It is here that Simon gets a new name, Peter. And don't don't be confused here. Jesus actually used two different words for rock. It wasn't on Peter that he built his church. He actually says, uh, and I tell you that you are Petra, and on this Petros, I will build my church. He called Peter Petra, which means like a little little pebble. From now on, you will be little pebble. <laughs> but it is on this rock that I will build my church. He was speaking of what John speaks about in his first verse. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was logos. In the beginning there was the rock. And on that rock, Jesus built his church. Jesus built his church on God because anything less and it would have been doomed to fail. He built it on belief because belief is a miracle because with God, nothing is impossible. Amen. I would ask that you would please stand as you are able as we lift up our hymn of the day, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. As one community in Christ, let us profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident that God receives our joys and our concerns, let us offer our prayers to the church, those in need, and all of creation. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son among us, that he may show us the way and be the light in the darkness. Thank you for being the miracle in our lives. Thank you for giving us our belief that we may solidly place our faith and our love on you. Be with us as we walk through this life. Be with us as we traverse through the, the pain and the sorrow and the fear and the evil and the sin and all that this world has to offer us. Be with us. Hear us, O oh God. Show your steadfast love and faithfulness for all of those in despair. Increase their strength. Increase those who are low. Bring us up into the light of your presence. Be the miracle in our lives and let us shine your miracle for others. Hear us, O oh God. Heavenly Father, there are so many of us that need you in our lives right now, in our presence today. This morning we especially pray for Joyce, Karen, Terry, Barbara, Rhett, Gregory, Dale, Pam, and Jax. Encourage those who offer their gifts and talents to the church. Embolden those who are suffering. Embolden us who are not, so that we may go out and be your light. Hear us, O oh God. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please share that peace with your neighbor. Let us pray. God of field and forest, sea and sky, you are the giver of all good things. 
Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness in us. that The world may be fed with your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. I would ask that you would please stand as you are able as we gather together in the Holy Spirit and pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please receive the blessing. The God who calls across the cosmos and speaks in the smallest seeds, bless, keep, and sustain you, now and to the end of the age. Amen. Today is a celebration Sunday, and so we get to uh, introduce our decade hymn. I would ask that you would please, uh, you can be seated for the uh, introduction video. Our own Howard Simpson is the voice of these. I think that we need to make sure that on the computer it's turned up uh, on the actual computer, uh, as opposed to on the board. But here is, there we go, here is Born and Cry. With so many hymns addressing God from a human perspective, Born and Cry is one of the few that addresses humanity from God's point of view. Written by Waverly Isle composer John Esbisacher, Born and Cry speaks of God's presence throughout the seasons of our life and has the feeling of a love song between God and the singer. The composition of Born and Cry began in 1985 when Yosef Acker was asked to create something reflecting the beauty of baptism. His first draft was rejected immediately, and he was told to take it home and personalize it. Jovis Acker did just that. He took it home, changed almost everything about the first draft, and created one of the most popular hymns in the late 20th century. In the early 1990s, along with the help of Zion Worship Committee, Pastor John Nordine compiled a homemade hymnal supplement, Notes of Praise, which contained Born and Cry, and it was regularly sung at baptisms, weddings, funerals, confirmations, and graduations. Just as the first stanza is the same as the last, the words in Born and Cry are timeless, and that it take on different meaning every time we sing it as our lives are forever changing, our families are changing, our relationships are changing, but the love of God is eternal and he rejoices in seeing our lives unfold. Again, I would like to thank Howard for, for doing this every week and again, an especial thank you to Howard for having to say Yulvitzacker three different times on that thing. I didn't realize I had put it in there so many times until he had done it. This is one of my favorite hymns. Please stand as you are able, and it's okay if you get a little teary-eyed when we play when we sing this song.
Go in peace. Share the harvest.